Uh, there we go. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you guys. If you're out there, I don't know if that speaker's set up, but if you can hear me out there, make your way in here. We're going to get this thing uh, kicked off. Uh, it is, uh, man, the fourth, the weekend of the fourth. Hope you guys got some exciting plans coming up. Uh, I am looking forward to, to relaxing, eating some good food tomorrow. Um, but we're glad you guys are here. If this is your first time visiting with us, uh, we, uh, this is just kind of who we are. We are a gospel-centered church, right? So that, that is what we're about. Uh, there's three big things that, that we're about here at Legacy, but uh, it's the gospel. So the story of God's favor on mankind through the person of Jesus, right? And then we're also about community. That's another big thing that we're about. Uh, that, that's a big value of ours, and that's the people that, that God builds and then uh, we're also about mission, right? That's the other thing that we're, we're really about. So the extension of the gospel to the world. So if you guys are visiting uh, every Sunday, those are the three things that we kind of focus on. Uh, gospel, community, mission. So uh, and, and we're about you know, knowing God, making his name known, and his, and, and his name going forth, right? Um, so if... Also, if you're first time here, you, you may have been welcomed on your way in. We hope you were. Uh, there's cards there that you can fill out, uh, and that just helps us get to know you, right? We're not going to spam you uh, with a bunch of random calls, but that just helps us know how we can serve you best. There's also a QR code. Um, you guys can uh, hit that thing, and that will also help you find that information. Um, and also, if you're trying to find a, a new com or a, a community group to, to get involved with, you can also scan that code, and that'll help you get involved uh, that way as well. Um, so our layout here at Legacy, we do things a little different maybe than what you're used to. Uh, we start out with a, with a call to worship, um, and that just looks like reading some, some scripture together. Um, and then after that, we will actually hear um, from uh, the, the message or the sermon at that point afterwards. And then we do our worship at the end. So that, that's the big difference um, uh, we do our worship at the end, and, and the reason for that is really just uh, as our hearts have been prepared through hearing God's word, we can respond via, you know, singing worship afterwards. So that's the reason for that. That's why we do things. Um, um, but that, that's kind of what's going on. Uh, that's how things, things look uh, this Sunday. Uh, we actually don't have any announcements this morning, so what do you know? Nothing Nothing going on. We just hope you guys have a lot of fun uh, this summer. Hope you have a lot of fun uh, tomorrow. So as we continue on, we're going to continue uh, into our call to worship. And, and like I said, that, that looks like reading some scripture together. But before we get to that, we want to take a moment just to uh, pray and acknowledge uh, what is going on around us. So there's two kind of things going on. One, uh, you know, there's a lot of kids back there in the back. Uh, that are being watched, and um, that's just no, that, that's not a measly task, that's, that's no um, small thing going on at this moment, and we, we trust, uh, and we have skilled people um, back there right now that are, that are in this moment shepherding our kids towards Christ, right, and that's just a supplement to what, you know, as parents we're doing at home, but that's something we want to acknowledge and trust that the Lord would continue to to work and move through and put his hands on. Uh, there's another thing that we want to trust the Lord with is, is our finances. Right, this Sunday, uh, we're, we're coming together. We don't, we don't pass a plate. We don't, don't do things like that. But uh, there is a way that you can give via um, online or there are boxes out, out back. But we, tr- we want to trust the Lord that he would bless our finances. Um, no matter where we're coming at, whether things are tight, whether things are abundant, we know that the Lord is in and working through all these things. And one of the greatest ways that we can worship the Lord is through our finances. Um, you know, and that helps us even reflect and see hey, what, what we're doing with our finances helps us kind of see how, how am I trusting the Lord? And so we want to pray over that. We want to ask the God that, that he would bless those things. Here at Legacy, uh, we want to bless our community via our church and the finances, and that's one way that we can do that uh, and, 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 you know, 
advancing the kingdom of the Lord that way. So we're going to take a moment. We're going to pray over those two things. And then after that, Charlie's going to come up and continue on leading us in our call to worship. God, we come before you, and uh, God, we acknowledge that that you are the Lord and, cre- and creator and sustainer of all things. There is nothing that we can do apart from you. We have no good apart from you. But Lord, you are so kind that you have uh, rescued us through Christ. But you are also so kind that you would entrust us with some big things. Uh, one of those being kiddos. God, you, you bless us with kids, you bless us with finances so that we can worship you, so that the world can see that something's different um, about the way that they go about these things, the way they go about their kids, the way they go about their finances. Lord, we, we know um, that you are greater than both of those things, um, but Lord, we know that you are behind those things. So Lord, we pray and ask that you would just guide us both of those topics. That right now, Lord, uh, the gospel will be going forth um, in, in kids' hearts, that um, laborers, that uh, missionaries, that, you know, God, influence, whatever, that these kids would be raised up to make your name known, to enjoy you and to make your name known. And God, we pray also over all the people that are working back there right now kids community God we're so thankful for them the way that they are volunteering the way that they are worshiping in this moment by serving and leading in that area God we also just want to pray once again just over our finances that Lord you would just be in that uh, that you would uh, lead us as we handle our finances that you would help us worship you as we handle our finances and that once again the way that we would handle those finances would be in a way that would glorify you. Um, God, we pray that you would just bless legacy abundantly financially, that um, and that in that, Lord, your name would be made known and you would be glorified. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We are continuing a series that we have been in for this year in Acts and we're glad that you're here to, to do this with us today. Um, we have been in Acts 17, and we're going to be continuing that today. Um, we are, as we've read through this, we've seen in Acts where the apostles are facing a land of idols, which is really interesting because, you know, nothing is new under the sun, is it? We are still in a land of idols and, but I'm excited this morning. Randy is going to be teaching us from Acts 17. And I think it's going to be really helpful for us as we um, navigate a land of idols, as we see the apostles doing that. And then um, there's a lot for us to learn as well. But um, our call to worship this morning is actually going to come from this. If you will stand with me, and if you're a guest, It's going to be right. Oh, it's already up there. These guys are on top of it all the time. You'll see that there is a bolded area. We do this in the form of a call and a response. So um, I will begin with the part that is not bolded. And then together we will proclaim this, the bolded area. Um, But I want to encourage you. We don't sing at the front end of our service, but we still very much consider this worship because it is. It's a proclamation that we are proclaiming together just without music and with a tune as we say it. But um, I want to encourage you to rend your heart to the Lord, to acknowledge him. In this scripture, you will see that we, we are giving acknowledgement and intention to a God who is worthy, the creator of all things, and where we fit into that. So I will begin Acts 17, 24 through 28. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands, for he needs nothing. Rather, he himself gives to all mankind 
life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. That should be encouraging to us this morning to know that the Lord has appointed the exact time and places that we would be. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. We are indeed his offspring. Let us pray. Father, we come to you as your children, and we pray that you would open your word for us, Lord. I pray for Randy as he teaches us this morning, and I pray for our hearts that they would be ready, Lord. And that is something that can only happen by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would unveil our hearts, that you would open our eyes, and that your word would become the life in the deepest place of us that we need this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charlie. You can sit down. We're looking at Acts 17, 16 through 34 today. And it's just a privilege to speak to you, to preach to you today. And uh, it's actually a great birthday gift too. See, today is my birthday. And I'm 33 years old. It's a... Uh, it's been pretty wild. Some of y'all laugh a little bit, but I feel like everything is starting to hurt. My back hurts where I've just beat myself up over the years. And, and some of y'all are like, you know, or, you know, a couple are like, hey, listen, you just wait. Just wait. Just wait till you're a little older. You know, but uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do is to exercise and uh, to stay in shape and keep my back strong and all this stuff. And so I work out with Chaz in the morning. We work out like 6 o'clock. You know, it's pretty early. Up 5.30 at the gym, 6. But... Believe it or not, there's days that Chaz doesn't show up. He, d he doesn't make it, right? He, uh, and it's on those days where I learn a lot about myself. You see, I find out what I really want when I'm alone. And in those days where I'm at the gym, right, I'm sitting there looking at the door, and Chaz just doesn't, he's not there yet, he's not there yet. And he just doesn't show up, and 10 minutes go by, and I'm like, you know, I could just walk in that door or I could just turn around and go back home, you know. And, uh, and that's often what I would do. I'd just say, you know, I don't really want to work out today. I'm, that's really, I would rather just go do something else. It's early. Let's go back to bed. We'll work out tomorrow. And, uh, and so the whole point is that when you're alone, you really do learn about yourself, what you want to do. And we're going to see that Paul, he's alone in Athens today. And Paul is going to be doing what Paul wants to do. And, uh, and a question we want to answer today is, is how should our motives, Paul's going to come into Athens, he's going to see a city full of idols, and, and, uh, and it's like, what should our motives be when we come into a place and we see idols and the worship of idols around us? And so let me pray for us, and then let's get started. Lord, we thank you for your word, God, I thank you for this passage in Acts 17. God, I just pray that, God, you would just help us to uh, bring the idols around us to nothing. God, that you would help us to spot them, to see them. And God, you would grow us by your word, God, to worship you and to love you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so I'm going to read this passage. We're going to go through Acts uh, uh, 17, 16 through 34. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Aragopolis saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. We wish to know theref therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend all their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Aragopolis, said, Men of Athens, I perceive in every way that you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. And therefore, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, that God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives life, gives, gives all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. 
and have determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. In him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to look, we ought to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the, the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And then of the and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom were, I'm going to butcher it, but Dionysus and the uh, Arab, Arab guy, and a woman named Dem- Dem- Damaris and others with them. And so, uh, so there's the passage we want to look at today. And so I want us to start with a picture of Athens. So Athens is probably unlike any city that you've ever been to or seen. See, before there was social media, before there was automobiles, uh, before there was newspapers, right? There's no printing presses. You have these cities and they have town squares. And Athens would be like that in, in many regards. It'd have a huge town square. But it'd also be a grand city. You know, there'd be a lot of splendor in Athens. I heard a guy talking this week and he said that the, the West... Our nation was built upon kind of two pillars. One was the thoughts of Jerusalem, right, Judaism, and then uh, then Christianity. And then another is Athens. Like Athens has shaped the world. This city has shaped the entire world through what they've thought and think. And so there's some great thinkers that have come out of Athens, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Democritus. All these people came from Athens, this city. And then this is also the birthplace of democracy, Athens. And so in this city... It is a, like I said, it is a grand city. Somebody called it the, uh, the intellectual metropolis of the Roman Empire. See, Rome was a great city, but, but Athens, this is where all the, the deep thinkers were. These were all the, the uh, thoughts that were trickled throughout the empire. These are the, these are the greatest minds in the world right here in Athens. And it featured, it featured this place called the Acropolis. And what that is, in Athens, there's a hill that overlooks the whole city. And on top of this hill, there's a Parthenon where that houses the Greek god Athena. And then there's a flat that overlooks everything. And and this flat is a place where the whole city would come up to and listen to talks. It says that the Athenians and the foreigners, they would spend all their time in nothing except hearing or telling something new. That's what these people love to do. They love new ideas. And so Paul comes on the scene, and he sees that the city is full of idols. That's the first thing he notices. It's full of idols. And it's this, it, the text, it, it should be that the city is full of idols, swamped with idols. There's thousands of idols in Athens. There's a quote I kept coming across, and it said that it was easier to find a god in Athens than a man. That's how many idols were created in Athens. And I imagine that they would have been beautiful idols. It would have been incredible craftsmanship, right? Like this is a grand city. I don't know if you've ever been to the Parthenon in Nashville, but, but if you ever see that building, right, you see all the gods they've carved out of stone, you're like, wow, that's, inc- that's incredible that they've made those things. And so in, in, in Athens, in the Roman, uh, Roman and Greek gods, you know, something to understand is that all the gods had their own domain, right? Athens, the uh, Athena, uh, Athena, her, her domain was wisdom and war. So if you were going to war, I guess you'd be praying to her. And, and maybe there was a, a, a god of the, the ocean. I think it's maybe Poseidon. I'm not really up to speed on all my Greek gods. But they had their own domain. So if you're trying to cross the, the, the sea, you'd be praying for safety. You'd be praying to him. And then these gods, these people, they also had their own creation stories. You see that... The Romans believed that they were made from a certain god, and so therefore they were a peculiar people. And the other people were made from different gods. And they all had their own unique creation stories and unique gods who made their people groups. And these gods, they often had to be appeased. They would be angry at people. Um, If you wanted something, maybe safe passage across the sea, you might have to sacrifice and, and do something, give something up to one of the gods in order to get safe passage across the sea. You had to appease them. 
And so Paul, he comes into town and into all of this and uh, this culture, and he starts in a synagogue where he always starts. And, and day by day, he is, or, or he starts in a synagogue, and people who would know, you know, know Judaism, be familiar with the, the scriptures, he, he begins to proclaim Jesus and the resurrection to them. But that's not enough for Paul. See, Paul is a, he's a go-getter, right? He's got a lot of energy. He's fueled up. He goes day by day into these marketplaces where that's just full of people. And he is he's proclaiming Jesus in the resurrection. And in Athens, like I said, there's a lot of smart people. People who have learned, literally like they've, you know, the, their teachers, 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 they learn from Socrates. They learn from Plato, right? They, they learn from Aristotle. And two of the groups that were uh, mentioned in Athens is the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, the Epicureans, they are, their people, and their worldview is that life is about human, is about happiness. That's what it's about, happiness, happiness. Whatever makes you happy, do that. And happiness is a result of getting away from pain. Anything that, that causes you mental anguish, get away from it. Physical pain, get away from it. Those things suck happiness. Pursue pleasure. It makes you happy. Pursue those things. They didn't believe in a, uh, a judgment. They didn't believe in life after death. And so therefore, there was just no reason not to pursue pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure, happiness. Pursue it. You know, it's kind of wild. It's like in 2,000 years, some things just haven't changed. Kind of like Charlie said, like, I know a lot of people today that, that they really don't believe in a judgment day. They don't believe in afterlife. And they, they pursue pleasure. Whatever makes me happy. And another group is the Stoics, and this is a group that uh, they are wild in what they believe, really. It's a, they're all about reason. And uh, emotions are weakness. If you're emotionally compelled to do something, you're weak. And they said just do something because it's logical, because it's coherent. Like that's how much they value logic in Athens. And, uh, and so these people, they just, they said be virtuous, okay, be virtuous. You'll be happy if you're virtuous. And, uh, and so they were, um, they didn't know if there was life after death. But that's kind of what Paul was bumping into. These two groups of people, these two different worldviews. And these guys, they did what Paul, uh, they, they did what normally people do. when Paul is going to come and he confronts them, right. He's going to oppose their worldview. And these people do what basically we all do is um, they call Paul names. Right, they call him a babbler, and uh, and so that one of the words they called him is a, a seed picker. That's what babbler means. It's not like a baby's babbling, blah blah blah. It's a it's a seed picker. And I thought seed picker. That's kind of a wild term, but it's really a derogatory term for Athens. See, in a city that that values um, logic in a coherent worldview, a seed picker is somebody who picks and chooses different ideas. Right, doesn't have a consistent worldview. It'd be somebody today, I think, as a Christian to say, hey, I'm pro-choice, right? Two opposing worldviews that they contradict each other. They don't mesh. And so the people of Athens, they, they value a coherent worldview. And so they slander Paul. But eventually Paul is proclaiming the gospel day by day, day by day. And he won't give up. He won't quit. Anybody who has talked to Paul, Paul continues to reason with them, to speak with them. And after enough time, they invite Paul to speak to the entire city of Athens. They say, hey, he does have something to say. And so they bring him to Mars Hill. And, and Paul is speaking not only to the entire city of Athens, but this is Athens. This is kind of like the leader of the world, of the Roman world, this city. And Paul stands up before him. And, and uh, like I said, he's going to contradict their views, right, their beliefs. And he's going to do it without apology. He's going to be confident, loving, caring, courageous, and yet he's still all alone. He's got nobody that's got his back. Nobody is pushing him on and encouraging him. He's alone. In this address, it would probably have been hours, but what we have in, in the Bible is just a quick snippet, right? Two, three minutes long. But this address probably would have been hours, so this is probably an outline of kind of his talk, what he said. And so he, he stands up before this city, and he says, hey, I see that you're a spiritual people, right? He kind of compliments them a little bit. I see that you're spiritual. But you know what? I found that 
there is this altar in the city, it says, to the unknown God. And that's kind of like a, um, a confession of ignorance to a degree. See, when there's so many gods and you have to appease them, you don't want to leave any gods out. But they don't know all the spiritual domains, so they're kind of like, hey, just in case there is a God out there that we don't know, don't fully understand, let's make this altar to this God. And so Paul is, he's basically saying, hey, listen, what you don't know, I'm going to tell you about this God. And Paul is reframing the thoughts of the people that he's, he's bumping into. He is, they call it pre-evangelism. It's before Paul can get to the gospel, Paul has to reframe their foundation, their view of God. See, that way he's not passing people in the night. And so here's how Paul lays this foundation. He says, hey, God is the creator. There's not many gods, but there's one God, the exclusive God. And there's no need for temples. See, they cannot contain God. God is greater than any temple. And God is not served by human hands. See, he doesn't need mankind. He doesn't need people to serve him, to appease him. He doesn't need our praise. He gives everything to everybody. And through one man, through Adam, God created Adam, through one man the world was populated. That we're all descendants. There are people groups throughout the world, but yet we all have the same descendants, Adam. And this God is sovereign over all things, all times, all places, all generations. And God has orchestrated everything in such a way that people would seek God, but yet there's a problem. That we don't. We're disconnected from God. But yet, even though disconnected from God, God is still near is what he tells the Athenians. He says that uh, we're, like your own poets would say, indeed, that we're God's offspring. And therefore, as offspring, as the creatures and not the creator, right, as a, um, we don't have the same intellect as our creator. We're, we're creatures. And so we shouldn't think that we can be, um, we can make gods out of stone, out of gold, out of our imaginations, as a creation, we just can't do that accurately. And so these gods around you, they're no gods. And God is calling you to repent. And on Judgment Day, he said there's going to be a day of judgment. That is, and Jesus is going to be this judge that is going to judge you. And we know that he's going to be the judge because he rose from the dead. And so the crowd, the response to the crowd, you know, it was a kind of a hard talk, right? It's like, hey, hey, these are really, these ideas are, they're opposing me. I'm not, I'm not, maybe I'm not a super fan, right? And so some people mocked Paul. And they didn't believe in afterlife, didn't believe in judgment, and say, hey, man, you just, you're still a babbler. But some were interested. Some were like, hey, I'll, I'll hear you more on this. And, and some people said, Paul, I'm, I'm going to follow you. I like what you're saying. I, I believe what you're saying is true. And so. But here's the big question I have for us today, for our church. Like, it is incredible to think about a man alone in Athens who, who gets to speak to the entire city and, and proclaim the gospel, or, or start to. But what caused Paul to do it? What caused Paul to exert that much effort? You know, if you and I went to a city like Athens, I might be like, hey, let's check out the city. Let's see the Parthenon. Let's hear some politicians speak. Right, let's do some of this stuff. Let's check it out. But not Paul. See, Paul, he says his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was full of idols. And idols, just some background on idols. Idols require worship. They're, they're, they're things that require our, our, our worship. And worship has this element of satisfaction or life. Right, like whatever I'm, um, that satisfies me, brings me life, like I'm kind of worshiping enjoyment, and, and also worship has this element of dependence, like I'm dependent on the thing to give me life, and, and I, that's what, if I'm doing that, I'm worshiping something, and, and God says that if you worship something that's not God, if you dethrone God, then it's an idol. See, if you say that God is no longer my supreme desire, right, if he's not my source of enjoyment, my source of happiness, but my desires are for the things of this world, for the, the creation and not the creator. And if I submit myself to the creation, to acquire the creation, have the creation, to find my happiness there, it's an idol. 
It's a worshiping and enjoying the creation over the creator. And it's a dismissing God. See, everything in this world when God made it was to reflect back to God. And so everything we receive from God, all the good gifts that we were given, is to say, God, thank you. Look how great you are. Look what you have done. Look what you have given. And everything is to reflect back to him. Everything that we use in this world is to do that. But when we want the creation, right, we want the thing, the object, what we're doing is we're disregarding God. If we do not reflect back to God, we're disregarding him. God, I, I do not really care about you so much. What I really want is this thing. You see, when you define idols like that, what you see is that we live in a city just like Athens, right? A city that's probably easier to find an idol in Knoxville than it is a man. See, each person has an abundance of idols, and we're always worshiping something, whether you, you're conscious of it or not. John Calvin famously said, the heart is a perpetual idol factory. Our, our hearts continue to make these idols. They continue to produce them. See, an idol is the thing that takes you from a bad day to a good day, right? That's your functional savior. If you can just have this, I'll be okay. I'll be happy. And idols are complicated too. See, we don't all have the same idols. Something that I might idolize, something that you do not, like you really don't care for. And so it's on a heart level, and, and I can't see your heart, and, but you kind of know. You know what you're worshiping, what you're finding happiness in. You know. And so it's up for you to evaluate your own heart. But I was just thinking some of the idols that commonly pop up in my heart is idols like I depend on my friend's acceptance to make me happy. If I have their acceptance, then I'll be happy. And it leads me to never contradict my friends, never oppose them, even when they're wrong, because I want them to accept me. Or if I have plenty of money, Right? If I have a financially free retirement where I can just do what I want to do, buy what I want to buy, I'll be happy. And so I sacrifice to the, the idol of money and, and I work, 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 and I save, save, save. Money can easily be an idol. Or I depend on food for my happiness and my satisfaction. I love to eat. I love to eat a quart of ice cream. I'll sit down and eat the, or maybe not a quart, a half gallon or whatever the small things, you know, Medium size. Like, I'll eat the whole thing after dinner. I love to eat. And it can easily be I find my satisfaction in just the food that I eat. And it doesn't reflect back to God. Or what about my family? You know, our family. All the good things that God gives us can easily be idols if they don't reflect back to God. And so my family, if I'm, if I'm trying to hoard my family and protect them, and, and heaven forbid that God afflict them in anything with any trial, cause any pain to my family, you know, or or really, heaven forbid, that they go be missionaries and move away, right? I begin to idolize my family. They become my source of happiness. And so idols is this, like, I mean, it's a, this is, I would say humanity is one of humanity's greatest problems, is that we worship idols and not the creator. So how do we deal with these idols? Well, I think idols kind of fall in two camps in this world. One is the, um, the respectable idols, right? Hey, he loves to work out, right? It's, hey, it's good for him. Or, hey, he loves to work on cars or, or whatever it is, right? There's some things we say, hey, that's really probably not hurting anybody. It's, it's okay to just love that. There's, there's not a lot of enjoyment in this world. There's a lot of pain and hardship. So if it makes you happy, go ahead and do it. Yeah, I, I respect that. But then there's the... Not socially respectable idols, but things like addictions and drugs. And, and if, you're, if you know somebody who's a, an addict, right, and they're uh, maybe doing some heavy drugs, and you're just like, hey, man, I know you're looking for satisfaction. You're looking for your happiness in these drugs, and, and you're submitting to them. You're, you're continually going to them, and, but it is destroying you. Like, it is, it is wreaking havoc on your life. This is not good. Yeah, you know, I mean... What I kind of see is that as you try to help somebody, right, and they keep returning to their idol, keep returning to, the, you know, whatever the addiction is, you begin to be like, hey, you know what, I just wish so-and-so would just be more like me. Like, just don't do it, right, don't touch it, stay far away from it. 
And what you begin to develop is a contempt for the situation, a contempt for the people who, who take drugs and, and are addicts. And you're like, hey, they're just, you know, maybe weak-minded. Maybe they need to be stronger. You know, whatever it is. But underneath it, what I really think, if you pull back the, the, uh, the veil a little bit, it's this sense of self-righteousness. You know, it's because, it's a, hey, listen, I don't do that. And I, I hate people who do do that. And it's kind of like I'm kind of self-righteous when I despise the people who worship idols. Because I don't worship them. But you know what? I have got my own idols that I worship. But Paul's response is a little bit different. And uh, it's very powerful. And the question is, what's the proper response when we see idols, people worshiping idols, when we worship idols? What's the proper response? It says his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. And this word provoked is such an important word. It's such a powerful word. And, and when I first read this passage, first started studying it, I just kind of went right by it. Right? I didn't really focus on it. It didn't stick out to me. But it's incredible that all of what Paul did, this is his motivation. He was provoked. See, Paul was seeing Athens as God sees Athens. Right? God was working in Paul his emotions. God's emotions for, for Athens. And, uh, you know, Paul was distressed. He was moved with compassion. But he's also provoked to a righteous despising of idolatry. Right? He hated these idols. See, when he sees that other people have dethroned God, dismissed God, his, his Lord, his master, his king, and his, his king is not honored, he is provoked to action. He hates that. Provoked just means to scorn, to despise. And here's how I, I know that this passage is, this is what Paul is feeling. Because if you look back into the Old Testament, the word uh, provoked is not used too many times in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, this is what God says. Moses is interceding for Israel's idolatry when Israel creates a calf. Deuteronomy 9, 16 through 18 says, And I looked and behold, you sinned against the Lord your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf and you turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took hold of the two tablets and I threw them out of my two hands and I broke them before your eyes. Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before, 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all the sin which you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And there's that word, provoke. See, God was provoked when he saw that Israel had made a golden calf. And just like Paul is provoked when he sees that in Athens they're worshiping idols who are not God. See, Paul scorns these idols. He seeks to expose them and to bring them to nothing. Paul's a, a fighter in that sense. He's a fighter for God's glory. John Stott said, it was not a bad temper nor pity that caused Paul to take action. It was not the fear of their eternal salvation. All can be good motives. But what Paul faced idolatry, he was angry and jealous for the name of God. Just as God is angry and jealous for his name. They're giving honor and glory to idols that is due to God alone. So Paul was not about destroying the men of Athens. He wasn't about raining fire down on them. He wasn't about any of those things. He was about bringing the gospel truth to the men of Athens. Because that is how God is going to be glorified. That's how God is going to be worshipped, is through the bringing of the gospel to these people and calling them to repent and worship God, the creator and not the creation. See, we should take note how Paul experiences this righteous despising of idols. And, and really, idolatry is unfaithfulness. See, we were made to enjoy God. And just as a man is, is called to be faithful to his spouse, right, to love his spouse and not love anything else. This is the image that God gives us. Kind of a man who sits with his wife on Sunday morning. All right, he sits back there in the chair and he, he puts his arm around his wife and he holds her hand and, and uh, maybe he's rubbing her arm. And, and he's affectionate and loves his wife on Sunday. But on Monday, he says he's going to work and he doesn't go to work. But he, he begins to have an affair and sleep with other people in the city. 
And on Tuesday, there's different lovers he runs after. And Wednesday, different lovers. To the point where he is just unfaithful. And, you know, if we knew a man like that, we would despise those actions. We would despise that. We'd say, this is messed up. This is wrong. I hate this. And I, I, I want to see you redeemed from it. I want to see you brought, uh, I want you to come in a right relationship with God and quit doing what's evil in God's sight. And I want you to worship God. And, and that's exactly kind of what idolatry is, is that, you know, we, we love God, but yet there's other things in this world that we love. We want them. They give us happiness. Right? They, they find that we find our life and our joy in these things. And it's adultery. And it's why if you look at the New Testament, commonly Jesus says, you adulterous people. That's, his, that's how, you know, he sees the lost world. And so if unfaithfulness is okay to you, if it doesn't bother you, right, if you don't despise it, then you're out of step with your master. Because God is provoked over idolatry. He despises it. You know, our real problem is what Paul said about our idols. Is all these idols, when we, when we, dis, when we um, push aside God, we worship the creation and not the creator, is that there is a day of judgment, is what Paul says. And on this day of judgment, it's going to be a hard day. And, and not only do idols dethrone God, but they also promise happiness and life, but they do not deliver. You know, some of the scary passages in the Bible is where, you know, Israel worships idols and, and there's a trial. Something comes up where they're being attacked or something. And then God says, hey, let your idols save you. Let your idols save you. You know, you've dismissed me. Let them save you. You see, on Judgment Day, all these false idols that we find happiness, we find life in, they're not going to save us on that day. Your intellect, your success in this world, it's not going to save you as you stand before God. Right? There's going to be no eating out of the distress of condemnation. There's going to be no uh, buying off God in his final verdict. Idols can't save you. They can't really give you the life that you want. They, they fail to deliver in that, that regard. And so we need to root out our idols. We need to, to find them, to look at them, and to root them out and to destroy them, to bring them to nothing. And so often I think we just don't feel like Paul. We, we don't do that so often because, one, we, we just don't see how God sees you know, maybe you're an unbeliever, you just don't know God, and you just don't see how God sees. Your heart just doesn't see that. But two, maybe you're just walking in sin and unrepentance, and, and you're kind of blinded, out of step with your master. Yeah, I think we really don't put our idols down, and we don't take the gospel, which is meant to just destroy idols. It's an idol-destroying gospel. But we don't take this gospel to our city because we worship our own idols. And we don't want to give them up. So maybe things like self-preservation and comfort. All these things that we find life in and joy in. We don't want to destroy those because, well, that's where we find life. Right? We don't want to bring this idol-destroying gospel because it would have to root up our own idols. And I think the real reason underneath it all is that we just don't really believe the gospel fully. There's, there's part of us that just that we still deal with unbelief. Kind of like the guy who says, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. See, we need to come into a better understanding of the gospel that, that all things are to reflect back to God and how good God is and how right that is for that to be the case. See, God, he sees our fallenness. He knows that we're idol worshipers. It doesn't surprise him. It doesn't catch him off guard. And he knows that our greatest need is to return to him and to be delivered from this day of judgment day, from, from being condemned. You know, the gospel, surprisingly, incredibly, is that Jesus is perfect for idol worshipers. That he receives us who worship idols as we turn from our idols and we receive him. He receives us. And the good news is that 
that Jesus' heart is gentle and lowly. There's a book we went through last year, Gentle and Lowly. And, you know, it really helped me understand God's heart. That God's heart is about rooting out our idols. Yes, he despises when his name is, is profaned and dismissed. But he's also about his children and rooting out our idols. Because he loves us and he knows that our greatest happiness is to worship him and to know him. Ezekiel 36, 24-25 says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. See, Jesus is our cleanser and he does it through what he does, through the life, the, the death of Jesus we see that Jesus lives a perfect life. He never worships idols. Everything he does in this world reflects back to God and gives God glory. Jesus never sins. He's sinless, flawless, perfect. And he takes his perfect record and he dies on the cross as a substitute. And he takes your record of, of idolatry and sin and, and he switches. He takes it upon himself and he gives you his perfect life. And he makes you justified before God just as if you had never sinned. Just as if you never worshipped idols. And just as if you'd always obeyed God. And he appeases God's wrath. Something that you could never do. No idol can, can appease God's wrath. Take away his wrath, his just wrath for your worship of idolatry. But Jesus says, I will take it. I'll take it upon myself and I will appease it and I will remove it from you, believer, so that you can experience the soul cleansing, idol removing relationship with God. And he's risen as a perfect intercessor on our behalf. That even as we worship idols, we cling to this world for satisfaction. Jesus is continually interceding. No, he, she, they're, they're mine. I bought them. I paid for them. Don't hold this against them. And he's continually interceding as we continually sin against God and applying his perfect work to our lives. And so on Judgment Day, we can stand before the King of Kings and hear a verdict of not guilty, not condemned. And not only not condemned, but rewarded for all our faithfulness. All our love and devotion and, and reflecting everything back to God and giving God glory, we'll be rewarded on Judgment Day for it, how we've lived rightly before God. And God, He changes our hearts too. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, um, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Right? He gives us a new heart. A heart that wants to obey God's commands. A heart that, that is gladly submissive to God because God is so great and glorious. Right, a, a heart that loves the goodness of God in all things, the redemption. We love to see our, our neighbors redeemed by the gospel. We love to see God work in their hearts. We love to see God work in each other's hearts and say, God, you are so good. You have redeemed so-and-so out of this. You did this. You've given me this good gift of, of children. Like You are so good, so overwhelmingly good. Hearts that love and worship God. Hearts that desire love and peace with God, right, truth. Hearts that make much of God. Hearts that trust God and look forward to Christ's coming to finally rid us of our idols. To finally make right all the wrongs of this world. A heart that loves that. And really a heart that, the, the gospel produces a heart that begins to delight in God. Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And it's the idea that believers, we're learning to delight in God, delight in God and, and want more of God. And then on a day of judgment, what we get is we get what we're delighting in. We get more of God. That's our reward in heaven is more, more of his goodness, his greatness, his glory. You get your desires Delight in God and you, you get them. God says you're going to get them. Come and delight. And, and take, take heart, take courage. It takes a lot of courage to put down your idols. To, to say, hey, these things give me a lot of joy and satisfaction. But you know what? I need to glorify the Lord and, and not cling to these. And so i got to start thinking, how is God glorified 
that's kind of my new frame in which I view this world. And we're going to live in a constant struggle of our hearts. And, and it's not going to go away. I think our, our flesh remains. And this battle remains. Will we worship the creation or the creator? So I would say, don't let your affections be for this world. Don't let them terminate on this world. God gives us good gifts, and these good gifts are to be enjoyed for God's glory, to give glory to him. But don't allow them to just terminate on creation because it's unfaithfulness. It's adultery, and it's despicable. Right? We should despise it when our hearts do that. And so some application is to one, believe the gospel. That it's the power for salvation. It's the power to destroy and root out the idols in our life. And don't just be okay with idolatry, but despise when you worship idols, when you worship creation over the creator. Despise it. Hate it. It's not right. God is not glorified. He is dismissed. Be in step with your master. And pray and seek the supremacy of Christ in all things. So whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. You know, I like these next two is take a regular Sabbath. You know, un, you know, take a step back from the world. One day a week, just step back and see if you can put down the things that you've been doing all week. You know, for me, it's investments. It's like, hey, I, I got to just back up a little bit, and I'm not even going to look at them on Sunday. They might drop off a cliff, but I'm just, I got to take a step back and see if I can take a step back from all the things that I'm trying to do and accomplish. Help you evaluate, are these things idols? Can you take a break? And I think last is be mindful of heaven. And this is a new one for me. Be mindful of our future with God. You know, learn what the Bible says about heaven and our hope of heaven. Allow that to empower you to realize that, hey, your idols are actually rubbish compared to heaven. They're rubbish. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, you can stand with me. I'm going to read a, one verse. We'll get out of Revelation 21.5. It says, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And to one who conquers, he will have his heritage. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. We're going to transition now to a time of communion. I don't know if you've got your communion cup, but there's some cups right here in the back. And uh, this is a time where we remember the sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross, that, that he shed his own blood and he broke his body to redeem us, to rid us of our idols and to bring us back into the right relationship with him. And so if you peel back this little cup, you'll find that there's a little wafer in there. And like I said, it's representative of the body of Christ. And as you take this, we want to remember that Jesus broke his body. He went to the point of death on a cross to redeem you. And we want to remember that. So let's take the bread. Likewise, Jesus spilled his blood. He poured his blood out for our a ransom for us to buy us back. So let's take this blood in remembrance of him. Let's drink. We don't believe it's actual real blood, but uh, uh, let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for your word, God. I just thank you for, and God, your heart. God, that despises idols and yet, God, seeks to root them out of our lives. God, you seek to redeem us and, and to save us from worshiping your creation over you. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to grow us and shape us and mold us. God, to love you and to worship you rightly. And God, to live before you. It's your name we pray. Amen.